Awesome, awesome. Well, for those of you who have just joined us, maybe you found us on our meetup.com platform, or maybe you found us on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram, however you found us, we want to thank you for being here and also want to encourage you to come become part of the Multifamily Investor Nation group. Uh, we have a group that's actually on Facebook. And on that group, it's a closed Facebook group where we take the conversations from these weekly webinars and continue them on our Facebook group. So if you have not joined that Facebook group, I would encourage you to do that so that you can start to have these conversations after the, after the actual webinar. So I'm going to type in the chat box here, a link for you to join the closed, uh, the closed MFIN Facebook group. So if you have not already done it, you can do that now. Just click on that and just join it. It is, there's a few questions it'll ask you ahead of times, ahead of the time so you can be a part of that. And uh, looking forward to having that conversation continued further after this webinar because we might not have all the, the time in the world to answer all of your questions, um, but I'm sure towards the end, uh, Yona will give you plenty of ways to reach out and contact him if for some reason we don't get um, the answers to your questions on this particular webinar. But do uh, continue to kind of have that conversation on the closed Facebook group. So Yona, I want to turn it over to you uh, and have you go ahead and get us started on this magical world of cost segregation. We hear so much about it. And a lot of times we hear these large words like cost segregation and we get, we get concerned or worried or wondering, you know, what, what is this all about? And, and so I want you to go ahead and take it away and, and, uh, and talk to us a little bit about what are some of these advantages of, of cost segregation and, and why we should do it and, and all of these different types of things as well. So take it away Absolutely. for us, Jonah. Absolutely. Thank you. I just wanted to start out by, you know, expressing my gratitude and uh, appreciation to Dan, you know, for having me on over here. And um, is, is my camera off? Because I don't see. Uh, no, we're on. Okay, there we go. Nope, you're good. You're on. Okay. So, and, so I, and I, one other thing I wanted to add, Jonah, is, is yeah. that I do believe you are the only person that I've had on twice on our webinars. So this is the second time we've had Yona on. He did such a great time on the, the first time we did it. It was actually when we first started doing these webinars. So it was actually right. in the fall of last year. So it's been almost a year since we've had him on. So glad to have you back. Yeah. And it's uh, you know, it's an ever, you know, changing topic. You know, there are new nuances that, that come up in the tax law. And I'd love to, you know, touch on some of that today that has um, kind of panned out in the last few months since the tax reform. There's been some updates to that and whatnot. So we'll get into that. Um, so yeah, again, my name is Yona Weiss. If you haven't connected with me already through LinkedIn or Bigger Pockets, that's where you'll find me on a daily basis. Um, hopefully providing valuable content like this and a lot of other stuff related to real estate and, you know, just in general. So thanks for having me today. We're just going to, you know, these are some of the topics we're going to cover. And if there are any questions, and I tend to talk a little bit fast. So if you have a question, please write it in the quick Q and A box or the chat box, whatever it is. And we can get to that question either throughout or at the end, there will be open Q and A. So we're just going to talk about some of the tax benefits of real estate investing. The basic one is called depreciation. We're going to break that down, what that means. Um, cost segregation, which is sometimes certain to cost seg. We're going to break it down. What does it mean? What's this weird name the IRS gave? to this amazing tax benefit. Bonus depreciation is a new um, law that was recently passed, or um, I should say updated in the recent tax reform. And so we're gonna get into that as well. Um, you know, who should be doing this? When's the best time? And what's this real estate professional status that we keep hearing about that gets the best benefits uh, when it comes to depreciation and cost segregation? Um, we'll do a short case study and the case that we're going to do today is going to be a little bit different than some of the case studies we've done in the past. And I will tell you why when we get there. So uh, if you have been on some of our webinars before, maybe you're just tuning in again because I talk really fast or maybe it's because it's important to, you know, review things. And we have an old saying, um, an ancient saying in our, uh, you know, Jewish tradition, which is that you don't know anything until you've actually learned it at least four times, which means you have to constantly review things. Just hearing something once, it's not enough. It's got to go in again, 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 until it kind of sinks in and settles in. So let's just jump right into it. A quick disclaimer. Okay. I'm not your CPA. I'm not your attorney. Anything we're offering here is tax, you know, information, but it's not advice for your specific situation. Things may change. 
uh, tax law may change. So this is just our disclaimer, my legal team wanted to make sure we put that in. Okay, depreciation. You may have heard that real estate comes with these huge tax benefits. And some people will say that it's one of the top three reasons why people invest in real estate. Okay, one is you know, appreciation, um, the equity that's involved in the real estate, the cash flow, and of course, tax benefits. So what's all this tax benefit about? The main thing that people are talking about is depreciation. Okay, now depreciation, uh, it sounds kind of negative, that connotation, but it means that property and everything goes down in value as time goes on. Okay, and it's a basic concept. We all understand that, okay? When you drive a car off the lot, it goes down in value, even though it's not inherently going down in value. And this is one of the most amazing things about real estate is that while the property may actually be appreciating, may actually be going up in value, that the IRS allows every real estate owner to take a tax deduction based on the purchase price of that property, which is called depreciation. And that usually spans over a spread of 27 and a half years for residential property. So that includes single family, multifamily, even the large, huge, massive multifamily, a 600 unit building is still, even though it's commercial in nature, it's still considered residential for this tax purpose, for this tax deduction. Whereas all other commercial properties depreciate on a 39 year schedule. That means that the purchase price of that property, the amount that was put into it, is divided up over 39 years or 27 and a half years. And every year, a small amount is taken off as a deduction. So that's what it means. You may be making money from your property, that cash flow, that net operating income, you may have heard this NOI. However, right off the bat, before you have to cut a check to the IRS, we take off a slice and did lower that income tax liability because of depreciation. It's just a straight write off. Okay, that's what it is. However, cost segregation is going to be an even better way to reallocate property into faster depreciation lives on a schedule of five years, excuse me, seven years or 15 years. And we're going to get into how that works. What are the mechanics of it? But just so you know, it's a way to actually accelerate certain aspects of that depreciation to get bigger tax benefits earlier on. So far so good. So let's just take a quick example. Let's say you buy a property for a million dollars, okay? And I usually use this threshold, not arbitrarily, but because as you will see, um, you know, the tax benefits that come with real estate are going to be proportional to the amount that's spent and cost segregation really makes sense, you know, above that threshold of a million dollars. So it can definitely make sense less than that. I'm using this example and you'll see why. Okay, we're always gonna take off a certain amount for land. Land does not depreciate, okay? The building, is what depreciates. However, we'll see land improvements is going to depreciate. So we're gonna differentiate that in a minute. So stay, hold on that. Million dollar purchase price, $150,000 land does not depreciate. What's called your basis, and this is the term that's used in tax terminology, um, is called depreciable basis of $850,000. That means if you did straight line depreciation, so your regular depreciation deduction would mean before getting a cost segregation, this is the tax deduction for a commercial property, 21,794, or for a residential, and again, multifamily is included here, 30,909. That means close to $31,000, because most of us here are in residential, in single family, multifamily. Um, so let's just speak to that for a minute. That means if you're making, let's say you're making $50,000 a year from this million dollar property, net operating income. It's, it's possible, it's pretty probable. That means right off the bat, $30,000, $31,000 is deducted from that. You're only going to pay taxes on the remaining $20,000. That's it. That's the tax benefit. That means you can be buying property, putting your money. And again, this million dollar property, you may have well only put in 20% down on that. That means you're putting $200,000 down on the property. The rest is financed from a bank or from investors or what have you. Maybe the 200,000 is also financed from investors but you're getting this tax benefit based on that purchase price. Okay, so far so good. Now we're gonna see that accelerating certain amounts of depreciation is actually going to increase this amount in the first year, first five years, which is going to get you huge tax deductions earlier on to make your tax liability literally zero. Okay, zero means you be making $50,000, it's your money. You don't have to pay it, 
until you have a liability. The IRS says, hey, guess what? You have more deductions than actual tax. Guess what? No tax this year, no income tax. And that's really how most people in real estate are making so much money because they're using the money they're making, reinvesting it, rinse and repeat. Okay, so here are the fundamentals. A conservation study, which is a study means that a, a company like ours, Madison Specs, will actually come send an engineer to the property and it, need, it requires an engineer to come and identify everything in the property and reallocate things to a faster life. So we said the property depreciates over 39 years or 27 years, but there are things inside of it, like personal property, which we're gonna give examples, like furniture, fixtures, all that stuff actually depreciates on a five-year schedule. An engineer has to come into the property, identify those items, give a value to it, break out those components, so to speak, and accelerate those tax deductions. Okay, there are, you know, I'm not gonna go through the history because this was actually, if someone wants this afterwards, you can hit me up. You can also check out the cost segregation audit techniques guide from the IRS, which lists a number of these um, case studies, which, um, not case studies, really landmark cases, court cases over the years, that cost segregation, which, you know, previously was called component depreciation, developed over the years into what it is today. So here's an example of some of the things we're going to do. Um, so what we're going to do is an engineer is going to come into the property and identify all of the stuff that's not part of the structure of the building, okay? And that can include everything from, and these are just examples over, these are actually categories. This is from a multifamily property, but every property is different. And you can see the you know, multiplicity of things that are in a property that actually have value in it. Once the engineer identifies what those things are, how much of them there is, what the amount is, what the square footage is, et cetera, can now use uh, industry standard costs um, and complete those calculations to see how much of that is actually worth and take that value as a tax deduction, okay? So building mounting signage, cable TV rough, and you see stuff like decorative lighting, kitchen appliances, carpeting, equipment, furniture, even stuff like window treatments, vinyl floor carpeting, all that stuff, you wouldn't even thought of that that's depreciated a faster life. You think, well, it's part of the building and fixtures. No, you can identify that, take that value and accelerate that depreciation. Now, before we get to the second category, I just want to point something out. People often think, well, why would I do this? Believe it or not, this is actually, according to the IRS, the proper way of depreciating your property. Meaning doing it, throwing the entire building and everything in it into one bucket is not actually the proper way of doing it. Now, the IRS isn't going to challenge anyone um, because you're taking all this, uh, you know, cable TV and all this, um, you know, five-year property and you're going to accelerate that, what are you doing? Are you doing something illegal over here? No, you're actually doing it exactly according to the law that the IRS requires you to do it. But putting it all into a 27-year bucket and depreciating everything over that longest period of time, and why don't they say, hey, why are you doing that? You're doing it wrong. You know why? Because we are creating more revenue for the Treasury of the United States of America. And as long as you're creating more revenue by the tax deductions, guess what? They're not going to go ahead and tell you, hey, you're doing this wrong. Okay, that's one theory. Obviously, there are many things uh, that go into that. Um, this second category over here, which is something that is completely overlooked in many cases, which is 15-year land improvements. Because again, we mentioned land does not depreciate, okay? But land improvements do. Now, someone asked over here, how do you know how much of the allocate, how much to allocate to land? There is actually no concrete, another weird thing, IRS, there is no concrete way or system that the IRS says you have to come up with this to allocate land. As long as it's done, um, it has some backing to it. So, you know, some people do it according to the property tax assessments, which in some states like California can be ridiculously high, like 50, 60, 70% crazy, um, which is not normal. It doesn't really make sense that a building and the land that it's on, the land is worth so much more than the building, but that's how it is. Some other people like to use, you know, um, look at other properties in the area and do comp comps, right? There are many different ways. We use 15% uh, just as a standard average number, 
But again, this is something that you know everyone needs to come up with or their accountants really come up with on their own. So that's a good question. But the land improvements, which means everything that's on the land, that can include, include concrete, right? The paving, the sidewalk, any retaining walls. You have fencing, parking barriers, okay? If you have like, you know, those poles that the handicap sign, that's 15, that actually the cost of that, the value of that depreciates over 15 years. A swimming pool, playground equipment, um, everything, landscaping, okay? And that's a huge one, especially if you spend so much money on landscaping, be beautifying the property. All of that value in a large property can sometimes be a lot, a lot of value can be, de be depreciated, excuse me, over 15 years. Um, so again, what is the cost segregation benefits over here? We're not creating, you know, deductions out of thin air. What we're doing is we take the entire property, we take the entire depreciation, and instead of spreading it out equally over 39 years, we're accelerating a portion of it. And usually it's anywhere between, I'd say 10 and 40% of that value can be accelerated to these faster lives. I'd say generally speaking, multifamily properties are usually between 20 and 30%, sometimes even more. And, um, you know, even, you know, 35, 40%, depending on the type of property. What we're doing is we're creating these deductions at an accelerated rate, which is really the time value of money. Time value of money means I am using money today instead of waiting to get it later on, which means that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar will be five years from now. So the other point of this is, is it's your money, okay? We have to realize the money that we're getting from our properties is our money, okay? Anything we have to pay in taxes, we have to pay. But if we do not have to pay in taxes, then we do not have to pay, okay? And this is really the fundamental thing. Later on, we may be having to pay, um, you know, a large amount of taxes, but this year, especially for someone who's investing and investing a great deal, okay, you're buying one property and holding one property for the rest of your life, conservation may not be the best answer for you because it may make sense for you to spread out your depreciation every single year over the 39 years for the same exact amount. But someone who is actively involved, especially people starting out, and they want to get involved. They want to make use of all of the capital they can. Guess what? This year's tax liability is what matters most to me and next year's and the next five years from now. Okay? And five years from now, I may have 10 properties. Okay? But if I didn't do cost segregation, I may only be able to get to two or three. And this is something very fundamental that people you know, don't look at the big picture. We're going to talk a little bit about what happens when you sell a property, depreciation recapture tax. But let's get right into bonus depreciation because what we want to know is what is this bonus depreciation? Okay, by show of hands, who knows what bonus depreciation is? You can just type in the chat box over there, yes or no. And let's see if anyone is still paying attention after uh, 20 minutes. Okay, we got one hand raised. What does the hand raise mean, Dan? Okay, we got no, 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 no. Okay, you got a couple of yeses. So some people are still awake. Yeah, so bonus depreciation is like this, and this is out of order. Okay, bonus depreciation. Let's actually talk about it now. We'll go back to those slides because those are important slides. For some reason, this is out of order. <clears throat> bonus depreciation is like this, okay? This came about with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Used to be, and it's a new law, but it's actually changed from an old law. It used to be that only newly developed property, okay, or newly renovated property was entitled to a tax deduction, which entitled you to take a write-off of 50%, 5-0% of the amount spent in that tax year, that first tax year that it was developed as a write-off um, if you elected that in the first year. Okay, now with the bonus depreciation in the recent tax reform, it changed to not only newly developed property, but any property, used property. That means something was placed in service by you for the first time, not something that was placed in service at all for the first time, okay? And this came into effect September 28th, 2017, and it changed not only from 50%, but to 100%. And this is going to phase out in 2023, which means it's going to reverse itself, already going to be down to 
80% bonus depreciation. So what is this bonus depreciation? It means anything that has a useful life under 20 years, okay? So that's all the stuff we discussed, that five-year property, the personal property, the 15-year property, the land improvements, all of the value of those things that we can reallocate, accelerate that depreciation to a faster life, get big tax deductions earlier on, we can now take the entire amount in year number one, okay? Again, the entire amount of that depreciation, again, 20, 30% of the purchase price minus land of that property. Okay, let's go back to our example, million dollar property, right? $850,000. You went ahead and took cost irrigation and reallocated 20% of that to five year, 15 year property. That means you could have done cost irrigation and taken about $180,000. Okay, let's just keep it around. $200,000 of depreciation Oh, spread over five years, 15 years. So it means in year numbers one through five, you're going to have a tax deduction of, let's say approximately, it was just 200,000 over five years, 20%, you're going to have $40,000 every single year. Okay. That's a lot. What happens? That's extra depreciation on top of the 30,000 that you would have had. What happens when you take bonus depreciation, you get the entire 200,000 deduction in year number one. Okay. So this is huge. This is a game changer for a lot of people, especially if you have large tax liabilities, because what we're going to talk about next is, and again, this is just a schedule taken from the, um, you know, the tax code. This is, you know, cut and paste from the actual tax code, the tax reform, um, what it's going to change to after um, in 2023 down to 80%, 60%, et cetera. So let's go back a little bit because I skipped a few things. What is a real estate professional and why do I need to know what a real estate professional is? Some of you may have heard of this. A real estate professional, that means someone who is involved in real estate as their main business activities, okay? And this is the rules taken directly from the tax code. You can use cost segregation. You can use depreciation deductions to offset all of your income, okay? Let me just take a step back for a second. Depreciation is considered passive income. Passive income, passive income means that it's coming from real estate. Okay, but I'm working full-time in real estate. I'm working on this property, but the IRS considers it passive income. What does that mean? It means that I cannot use that passive income, right? The $50,000 cash flow I'm getting, I cannot use depreciation, which is a passive deduction to offset any other income only the income from the property. Okay. That's what's called passive deductions can only be used to offset passive income. However, someone who is a real estate professional can actually use these passive deductions to offset all of their income. So let's say, you know, you're a real estate broker and you own properties. You may be making, you know, a million dollars, but let's say your properties are only netting $200,000 a year and you're making a million dollars from your brokerage. Okay, you're going to be taxed. If you weren't a real estate professional, you'd be taxed on that million dollars at probably a pretty high rate, right? Talking 39%, perhaps 38%. What happens when cost irrigation comes into play? You're going to now be able to take depreciation, a bonus depreciation on your properties to offset that entire million dollars. If you have properties that can produce a million dollars of depreciation, even though you're only making, let's say, $200,000, $300,000 a year from the properties, you can use that bonus distribution to offset your entire income. And that's only if you qualify as a real estate professional. Well, what's a real estate professional, Yona? I'm glad you asked. Well, it's actually two things qualify you as a real estate professional, you or your spouse. So this is really something that a lot of people take advantage of, which is that let's say one of the couple, okay, husband or wife is a, in real estate. And the other one is a very high W-2 earner, okay? Or let's say one of them is a W-2 earner, they're starting to invest in real estate, and the, you know, one of the, one of, you know, the wife or the husband is stay at home, okay? Now, they could go ahead and get their real estate license, start being more involved in the actual day-to-day -day activities of property management, of, of doing that, and now both of them, if they're filing jointly, can qualify as real estate professionals, check that box, which means you can now use depreciation and maximize it. Whereas if you weren't, then you'd be taxed from your real estate on one thing. Depreciation can offset that, so the rental income. And on your W-2 job, you'd be taxed at you know, the much higher rates. 
So there are two things. Again, you or your spouse, you have to have either both of these to qualify. Number one, more than half of your involvement, your services during, throughout the year are involved in real estate, okay? The second thing is it has to be more than 750 hours, which isn't a lot. It's about 16 hours a week. It's not a lot or three months a year, depending on how you look at it. So if you want to get involved in real estate and make a lot of money and get a lot of tax deductions, you still have to work, okay? You can't go ahead and retire and still get this status and be able to use all the tax benefits that come along with it. So what's real estate? Business, either you're developing, redeveloping, constructing, acquiring it, converting, renting, leasing, operating, managing, brokering, real estate, all of these things, any of these things, you know, if you have hours that support this trade, then you are a real estate professional. You can check that box and now you can take advantage of all that great stuff. Um, even if someone is uh, not a real estate professional, you, if you're, if you're Maggie, it means you're, you're adjusted gross income is less than $150,000, then you can still take advantage of some of that depreciation to offset your other income. Again, this is a little bit more of a complicated topic. We're not going to go too deeply into this, but if you have questions on it, please feel free to follow up with me afterwards. So you can take, you know, if it's under $100,000, your income, you can still take $25,000 from depreciation to offset your other income as well, not just real estate. So I did these slides. I'm now skipping forward because we did this. Net operating losses. Um, this is something that also changed, which is going to, you know, combine with bonus depreciation to kind of make it a little bit of a more even playing field for the treasury, for the IRS, which means that what happens if you make $200,000 a year and you get bonus depreciation and you get a million dollars of tax write-offs? Well, where does that, you know, you're only offsetting $200,000 so of income. Where does the extra $800,000 go. It's just considered a loss. It puts you in the minus. Your income is actually negative. Is that a good thing? Well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't go away. It's put into like some imaginary bank called net operating losses. Okay. And it's carried forward, which means it's carried forward future years. You can actually use it next year if you need it, but now you can only use it according to this new law. You can only use it to offset 80% of income in the next year. Now, depreciation can be used to offset all of that, but the net operating losses that are carried forward can only be used to offset 80% of the income. So the IRS kind of balanced it a drop, but there's definitely still ways that you can use this going forward. When you sell a property, all of that imaginary bank account gets released of any net operating losses that were carried over and left over, which after depreciation and all their income can now be used as well to offset um, other income as well as capital gains, et cetera. So when is the best time? I see a lot of questions coming through over here. Um, so I'm actually going to, cause it's on the topic. Let's see if you're not a real estate professional, can you use depreciation to offset other properties or only what is associated with a specific property? If you're not a real estate professional, you can still use depreciation to offset other properties. Um, However, not to operate, uh, offset other income that's not associated with real estate, with rental income. Okay, another question over here. As an LLC pass-through, can't I use the passive deduction to offset passive income? That's exactly what he asked, sorry. Um, yes, but that's, again, only other passive income. Correct. So, again, we're not, we have to realize passive income, that means income coming from rental properties are all considered, right, if your LLC, it flows through to your personal. So anything that's created from rental income, that's all considered that passive income. Depreciation can be used, right, to, to go around. It can be shared around. But we're talking about income that's coming from W-2, income that's coming from other sources not related to real estate. If you're not a real estate professional or even related to real estate, like I said, the, the broker's fees, the, um, uh, you know, the commission fees, et cetera, that's not from the rental property. That's considered active income and is taxed at a much higher rate unless you can use depreciation to offset those as well. So when is the best time to commission a cost segregation study? Now, a lot of people actually are doing this and I've got a lot of requests from this recently. People that are under contract to buy a property, they want to see what are those numbers? What can I project? What can I predict? is going to be my tax write-off, my tax benefit if I did a cost segregation study. Um, and this is a great thing to do. And we actually offer this as a service. 
Madison Specs to do this um, anytime. You know, it's a free service. So I urge you, if you have a property that you're looking at, whether you bought it this year, last year, it doesn't matter, you're going under contract, you can reach out to me, we can do that, run the numbers for you, you can actually see what the potential benefits will be. Now, this is a good thing as well for the banks. Believe it or not, you can actually help with the underwriting process for a loan. If you're looking to buy a property, a lot of times you're financing it, the bank's gonna underwrite, gonna look and see what's your income, what's the debt service, you know, how much you're paying, and they're gonna look at the cash flow as well. They're usually gonna look at projected cash flow um, for the next three years. So they're gonna look and see, hey, wait a second, not only with cost irrigation, not only is your cash flow, you know, gonna be X, but now it's not even gonna be taxable because of cost irrigation in many cases you're gonna have a much higher chance of getting that loan to show, hey, all this income is coming in and I'm not even gonna pay tax on it. So it actually has helped many mortgage brokers have approached me to you know, help them get this free study, this free analysis, again, uh, with those projections to help in the underwriting process. After the acquisition of the property, again, it's gonna be used in the tax year that you place that property in service. So if you buy a property today, July 23rd, 2019, this is going to affect your 2019 taxes, okay? You can't use depreciation um, you know, on your 2018 taxes, even if you're still filing an extension. After a renovation, which means if you go ahead and now buy a property, okay, you do a cost irrigation study on it, you get $200,000 of extra tax write-off, and then you go ahead and do renovations. That means you gut it, okay? Or not gut it, let's say you update some units, you, you put in a new parking lot, you put in a swimming pool, who knows what you do, you can actually now go and take the amount that was spent. First of all, you can write off the amount that was disposed of. Okay, that's called a disposition. You can write that off. And now you can do a new cost irrigation study. It's an updated study. It's not an entire full study, which our usual full studies are like 80, 90, 100 pages long, a very detailed you know, work. What it ends up being is getting a double dip. Now you're not only getting that million dollars you spent on this property, but now you went ahead and put in another half a million dollars to upgrade it. That half a million dollars is now added to the basis. And unless you do a cost irrigation study, all of that amount is gonna be spread over the 27 or 39 years as well. Doing a cost irrigation study on the updated amount can actually bring you those tax deductions and bonus depreciation can get that all back. So you can spend a half a million dollars um, in this year and actually get you know, probably half of it or a large amount of that back as a tax deduction in the first year of doing that. A newly constructed property is great to do it. And a look back, we call this a look back study. There are different names for it, right? A retroactive study means if you didn't know about this and let's say you bought a property in 2015, okay? Four years ago, you didn't know about this. You're doing straight line depreciation until now. You can now retroactively get all of that accelerated depreciation that was missed and you can now get that in this year. And you don't even have to amend any tax returns to do that. And this is a great way, let's say, well, why would I do that? You know, it's not always gonna be beneficial to do this in the first year, because if the first year is not gonna be producing income from the property, um, or let's say you have other deductions, you have other losses from other properties, you may wanna take advantage of this, you know, when you have the needs. So this is where tax planning comes into play. Uh, but again, you can do this retroactively without amending tax returns. You do a what's called a catch-up depreciation. You file a form 3115, which is we actually do that as a service for our clients. It's a kind of complicated form that allows you to just change the way that you're depreciating your property. From an improper way, again, remember, doing it straight line is considered improper, according to the IRS. From an improper way of straight line to doing it in a proper way, breaking it out into the categories. That's actually what it says on the form. I'm not joking. It's conservation is considered the proper way of doing this. Okay, uh, I can see some more questions over here and we're gonna get to this case study. So let me just see these questions. And thank you guys for asking these questions. These are amazing. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna answer this question, Angel, because it's not, uh, there is, oh, there are different ways of doing that. So you might wanna ask your tax professional to give you a straightforward answer on that. Different ways of looking at it, I'm not gonna say one way or the other. If someone purchases a property that has less than 20 years of useful life left, can you take the diabrotin depreciation? So yes, again, let me reiterate this. this. is a great question from DJ. When you buy a property, and I, I said this at the beginning, but let me just repeat it now because it's so important. Depreciation is like this weird kind of 
phantom thing that doesn't even make sense logically. If you buy a property today, 2019, that was built in 1912, okay? It was built over 100 years ago. You're saying, well, this doesn't have any useful life. It's all falling apart. No, the IRS says whatever you spent on it today, that's called your basis. It starts over day one. Depreciation starts over day one when you buy it. Okay, so bonus depreciation on that? Yes, day one when you buy that property, you take 100% bonus depreciation and that's the amazing thing about depreciation. It starts over when you buy it. It doesn't have to do with depreciation that there's actual useful life in it. Now there is, don't get me wrong, there's actually some calculations that are involved. The engineers do based on when the property was built and there are some variance, variances to um, you know, how much depreciation can be taken versus uh, if it was built at a later date, but it's very, very minute and very small. So that's why I'm kind of saying it doesn't, it's, it's not really relevant. Okay. I'm going to do a case study over here. And this is one of our clients. And this is an amazing property for two reasons. One, because in North Carolina, okay, this amazing thing. Two, because it's a small property. I think a lot of people on this forum today, on this panel, um, this webinar today can relate to this. Previous webinars have done very large properties, you know, 13 million, 17 million dollars. I know that's what Dan is buying now. But for a lot of us starting out and looking at our first property, myself included, a multifamily property, we're probably going to be looking at something a little more small like this. Okay, so this we can relate to, and I want you all to um, to check this out. Okay, the guy bought a 32 unit. And you can see these are the pictures. It's a one-story building. Okay, it's actually two stories inside but they're one story, they're spread out like this, 32 units, garden style apartments, $1,750,000 was the purchase price, okay? Now it was his first multifamily property after this guy, you know, he owned a number of single family rentals and he was going into multifamily for the first time without cost segregation, okay? On this property, after allocating a portion to land, he would have gotten 54,000 and change of depreciation, that's great, okay? He was making, you know, uh, the NOI, he was you know, fixing it up and he was getting great income from this property. So you know, that 50K was going to help him out right off the bat to knock off a good portion of the income coming from the property. However, he had some other things as well. He had you know, some capital gains from a failed 1031 exchange. If anyone knows what that is, that's you know, something that could have offset capital gains tax from the sale of a property in a previous year. And he didn't know what to do. So this is what we did. Check this out. Purchase price, $1,750,000. It's another nice picture. Um, we classified like this. Again, $262,500 for land. Land does not depreciate. But look at all this beautiful land improvement. The landscaping, okay, not so beautiful. <laughs> the parking lot over here, okay, the pavement, all of this has value to it and depreciates over 15 years. That's that 15-year property over here. We allocate about 8% to that, the 15-year property, and 20% to five-year property. Okay, that's a whopping 28%. That's over $400,000 of extra tax deductions that he could take over those first five and 15 years. And he elected for 100% bonus depreciation, which means the guy had, you know, $400,000 in change of tax deductions this year, which helped offset the capital gains tax that he had from the previous failed, um, you know, exchange from last year. And he didn't know what to do about it. Guess what? The guy called me up on the phone with tears in his eyes. I'm not joking. The guy was literally tears. Of, I don't know if it was tears of joy or it was just, he was, he was so overwhelmed that he had been thinking he's going to now have to cut a check to the IRS for a few hundred thousand dollars. Now he can literally knock it off just like that with one conservation study. Um, incredible. Yes. Yes. Oh, Bobby. Thanks for joining Bobby. Great comment over here. Yes, it applies to residential real estate. It applies to all real estate unless it's your personal residence. Okay, that's the only thing it doesn't apply to. If it's your personal residence or you are not tax liable, let's say it's a nonprofit, you know, a church or whatever, what have you, um, not taxable or your personal residence. Every other type of property, guess what? Cost segregation you can use. Let's go right into this. So that's pretty much it. Um, I have you know, gone through this extremely fast because of our time limit today. Uh, I know there are so many things that I did not cover, but if you do have questions, please put them in the question box. I'm going to do a couple more slides over and then open the floor to questions. And, um, you know, feel free again, those of you who are on here, I really appreciate. And this is really where 
appreciation meets depreciation. So I know it's a corny joke, but I love to say it because I do appreciate Dan and you guys for coming on today. So um, please reach out to me, LinkedIn. It's the best place to find me. Bigger pockets. Shoot me a message that you enjoyed the webinar and I would love to meet you there. Who should you look for? What should you look for in a cost segregation study? So this is actually taken from, and I, I put it over here, the tax, um, the IRS cost segregation audit techniques guide. Okay, you guys can go check it out over there. Google it. It's fun to read if you want to fall asleep. So if you guys have insomnia, great reading. Okay, it's like textbook. But there it describes what goes into a quality cost segregation study. And there's 13 principles over here that if you want to make sure that you are getting your cost segregation study done right, you want to make sure this study includes all these principles in it and is not just like a number thrown at the wall. Remember over here, this number over here? 20%. How did the engineer come up with 20%? Now, some people, and I know accountants that actually do this, were like, well, hey, I'll just come up with 20%. You know, the guy bought it for 1.7. We allocate some land, whatever. 298,000, five-year property, puts it on the depreciation schedule. There's no backup. There's no sourcing, you know, to the tax code. There's no doing your homework, okay? What happens if the guy gets audited over here? You know what happens? One thing he's going to fire his CPA. That's for sure. The second thing is that he's going to be hit with big fines um, for not doing this property. Okay. So you want to make sure that it's done according to all of the rules, uh, methodology, documentation, um, common nomenclature, numbering system. It's crazy, but this is what you actually have to do to jump through all these hoops to get these tax benefits. Um, what are you going to be looking for in a cost segregation company? And there, I know there are many out there. In fact, I know there's someone else here on the webinar today who's from another cost segregation firm. So I appreciate you uh, joining to learn as well. I love to learn more on my industry whenever I can. Um, so yeah, there are many firms that what should you be looking for. One thing you should definitely look for, there are engineers and tax accountants um, involved in-house. Okay. They're not outsourcing stuff to other firms or to, you know, random people. It's in-house. They take responsibility. Um, they have a feasibility study, which means they can show you up front what your costs will be, what the fees are going to be. Okay. It's not something to change. We have Madison specs, you know, thank God we've been doing this for over 13 years, 14 years already. We've done over 15,000 cost segregation studies across the country, all 50 States. And, you know, we have, um, a team of over 60, uh, six zero individuals, engineers, accountants, and operations team who are, you know, been doing this for decades, literally. So, even though the company has been found in this, but our team comes from, you know, much more experience in the industry. So you want to be looking for that, not just trying to get someone who will, you know, get you those numbers um, or even someone who's doing it with a computer software, which does not hold up in an audit. So that's something you want to be looking for. Um, again, this is just a little bit more about our firm. Um, hundred percent audit protection means that if you were ever to get audited, God forbid, we stand behind our work. 100%. We have never had any fail in any time. Um, clients, 15,000 studies. We've had, I think, 13 audits of our clients. And for other reasons, obviously, cost radiation does not cause that. But you want to make sure that if that were ever to happen, that they have the experience and we have 100% no change in that regard as well. So we stand behind that. A um, little bit more about me, uh, Yona Weiss from Madison. We have a number of other services. So we're Madison Commercial Real Estate Services. Some of you from the Texas may know our guys out in Texas, Dallas. Who's from Dallas? Who's from Texas over here? Knows Madison title. Okay, we have offices in Cleveland, in Dallas, New York, New Jersey, Florida. Um, and we're pretty much doing this all over the country. Escrow 1031 exchanges, lease abstracting, a lot of different stuff. So one-stop shop. Any questions? I see there's some more in the question box. Here's my contact information if you want the feasibility analysis. And really, I do appreciate you guys coming on. I see some people have jumped off already. Uh, but yes, does it work with multi-use property, residential and commercial? Yes, of course. Yes, it does. Absolutely, 100%. Matt, great question. It works on any type of commercial property, any type of commercial property, um, as long as you're not your personal residence. Now, what happens is great question over here, but I'm not going to get to the next question over here. Thank you, Mike. You're awesome. Um, I got two screens, so I'm looking over here at the questions, but I want to thank you guys for coming. What happens if you live in one of the units? Okay, let's say you have a fourplex. And this is very common, house hacking, right? You have a fourplex and you're renting out the other units. Can you do depreciation on that? Because depreciation does not apply to um, your personal residence. 
So the answer to that is it's prorated or it's actually allocated to the amount that you live in. So let's say you bought the property for a million dollars. Um, you know, three quarters of that are going to be depreciable and one quarter of that is not going to be able to get those tax benefits. Uh, okay. Some more questions over here. So hundred units, I see John and please keep the questions going guys. When does it not make sense? Let's do one by one. Let me see if we, if we, everyone's doing it in the chat box. It's actually a Q and a box, but, uh, that's okay. We'll just do the chat box. Can the cost Marcia, 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 I think Marcia. Yeah. Marcia asked, can the cost of the conservation study be written off as an expense? Yes, it can be written off as an expense on your business. Great question. Um, does it work? So on hundred percent, John asked over here on hundred percent unit property, is there a way to estimate what the cost of the study would be so we can budget our offering to purchase? Yes, of course there is. John, awesome question. I didn't really talk about cost over here because every firm is going to be different. Our costs uh, for cost of your study are pretty competitive out there. I'm not going to tell you what they are here, but it's usually between and it's totally based. Now, this is very, very, very important. Another thing I didn't mention over here, but very important. It should be based on the scope of work. It should not be contingent to your tax savings. If a firm is charging you saying, hey, you're going to get a million dollars tax savings, we're just going to take 10, uh, you know, 10 percent of that. Not big deal. OK, no, that's wrong. It's actually not really allowed by the IRS. So make sure the firm is not charging on a contingency basis and rather on a consultancy basis um, for the services provided. So, you know, that being said, our, you know, fees de you know, depend on the size of the property, the scope of work, but usually between four and $7,000. Okay. It's not a big, that's a huge property is, you know, much, much larger properties. We've done many like skyscrapers and, you know, office buildings and office parks and, you know, a million dollar, million uh, square foot Amazon, you know, center distribution center. And yeah, the fees are going to be a little bit more, but not tremendous amount more. So, yeah. So John, definitely check me out, hit me up. I can get you that, um, you know, estimate and the feasibility to see if it's even worth doing. Will the slides be downloadable? I will be providing this or, or Dan will be, I don't know who will be, but, um, yeah, we can definitely get it done. Greg asked over here, when does it not make sense? Oh, one second. When does it make sense not to do, I guess the same question. When does it not make sense? When does it make sense not to do cost segregation is doesn't make sense a few things. Number one, if you don't need the tax deductions, it does not make sense to do it. Okay. You're like, Hey, I'm going to spend all this money. I'm going to spend, you know, $5,000 and I'm going to get a hundred thousand dollars or 10,000, you know, hundred thousand dollars of tax write-offs. Well, guess what? If you only have only income of $10,000, getting that done is not really going to help you so much. Okay. So that's the first thing. Uh, when it doesn't make sense, another time it wouldn't make sense is if you're planning on selling it within a year, not only doesn't it make sense, it's, you actually can't do a conservation if your intent was to, to sell it because you don't get depreciation on that. It, but if you, even if you're selling it within two years or three years, it may not make sense because something we actually didn't touch on, I meant to, which is depreciation recapture tax, which means you have to pay a tax on the amount of depreciation you took over the course of ownership. So that's going to come into factor on your tax planning. You know, one of my benefits going to be the time value of money having this cash flow now versus what I'm going to have to pay in tax when I sell the building three, five, 10 years from now, that's going to be something that's going to come into play. Um, otherwise, when doesn't it make sense? Again, on a property under a million dollars, it may not make sense. Under $500,000, very few times is going to make sense. Uh, but there are cases when it will. And again, very much based on your personal uh, situation. Uh, any more questions over here? If you have, DJ asked a great question. DJ, hopping in with all the good questions today. If you have a residential and commercial property. Resident on top, it's called a mixed use property to use 27 and a half or 39 years or a mix. That's probably number one question. That's an awesome question. It's actually a rule the IRS says it's called the 80-20 rule. And I don't really understand why it's so, but this is what they say, okay? And it's a really good question. If 80% of the income, okay, of the income doesn't have to do with the actual space. So even if it's like, you know, 30,000 square feet of residential and 10,000 feet of, of commercial on the, on the ground floor has to be the income. If more than 80% of the income is coming from the commercial, then it's going to commercial um, schedule 39 years. If less than that, then it's going to residential. Okay. 
So if you have investors in a syndication, would it be feasible to do a study and calculate that to invest a return? Another awesome question from John. Yes, it is. And not only that, I think Dan is back on the call over here. Dan can probably speak to the fact that, you know, is this beneficial to the passive investors on a syndication? Yes, absolutely. So it depends on the operator, of course, because, you know, they have to make sure when you're you know, talking to the various operators, when they do these studies, that they actually pass those benefits through to their investors, because there is an ability for them to not pass it through and they take all that benefit. So you just right. have to make sure when you're vetting your sponsors that you're making, you're making sure that they're actually passing through that cost segregation and those depreciative benefits to the investors. Correct. And that's going to be in the operating, uh, you know, agreement, you know, it should be spelled out and there obviously the legalese there has to be spelled out because it will make a difference. If it's not spelled out, it will probably automatically go um, to everyone. If it is spelled out, then you want to make sure that your lawyer, you know, attorneys is reviewing that. But yes, it can, you know, if everyone is in that pool together, according to the percentage of ownership, you know, if you're owning shares, you're owning a percentage in the LLC, it's going to pass through to everyone equally. And that's going to show up on the K1 tax returns that everyone's going to get showing their amount um, earned and amount lost. So great question. And to that, same, to that same aside here, I will also plug our group, PassiveInvesting.com, because we do, do, talk, do cost segregation and pass through those benefits to our investors. We're investors in each one of our projects ourselves. And so we like those benefits ourselves as investors. And we pass those through, just like you said, Yona, based on their, their actual equity position in the deal. That's how we actually parcel those out. And in the awesome. comments box here, I went ahead and put a link to our website, PassiveInvesting.com. So if you're interested and want to join our, our list of passive investors and seeing some of the deal flow that we have, you can certainly click on that link, find some more information about our group and, and some of the projects that we have coming up. Awesome. Are there any more questions over here? Yes. Healthcare facilities, school living homes, citizen living memory care facilities, independent living facilities, consider residential properties or commercial. Another awesome question. Now these are actually probably, believe it or not, probably the most beneficial um, for cost variation. Not the most, but of the most beneficial cost variation um, for commercial properties because there's so much five-year property in there. There's so much equipment in every single room, every bed, right? is so expensive. There's so many, um, you know, the nursing stations. There's so much going on in all these uh, facilities there's a large percentage is usually allocated, you know, sometimes up to 30, 40% is just to that five-year property. So assisted living is great stuff. Um, is it considered 27 or 39 years? It's usually considered 39 years, but it depends on, um, you know, how it's operated. Actually may depend more on, you know, people living there. So actually I believe many of them are considered 27 and a half years. So um, for example, hotels, on the other hand, are considered 39 years, but yeah, residential assisted living is 27 and a half year schedule because people are living there. Well, Yona, I, I really appreciate all of this information. You've answered all of these questions and I'm sure there might be some people that are watching that, you know, maybe still have some additional questions and, you know, they can reach out to Absolutely. you uh, via that contact information that was on the screen earlier. And uh, want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your schedule for sharing with our, our audience and our network again, and uh, looking forward to having you back on a future webinar as well. Always a pleasure, Dan. Thank you again. And uh, thank you all for joining and hope to see you on the other side. Well, everybody, thank you so much for, for being here with us. Make sure you go and reach out to Yona for any additional questions that you might have. And yes, he's all over LinkedIn. He's now on Facebook. And I'm going to eventually get him on Instagram because I will tell you, Yona, there are nine people that registered for this webinar oh, wow. because I promoted it on Instagram. That's crazy. Oh, so okay. you got some additional <laughs> views from people that are on Instagram. So another platform to jump you on other than just bigger pockets and LinkedIn. Okay. Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon and uh, thanks again for joining us. Okay. Thanks everyone. All right. Bye. Thanks.